Hi folks, G3 here, and welcome to another instalment of my journey to go green. Thanks to everyone who watched my test drive and review of the MG5 EV. There were a few things that weren't clear to people, so they left questions in the comments down below, and you can do the same on any of my videos, and I'll do my best to answer them. But as a result, I thought it'd be great if I just ran through a few of those questions and answered those in a video here for those who haven't had a chance to read through the comments. So let's have a run through of those now. Many thanks to Mark Chinnery, who left quite a few questions and observations. Mark said, I may be wrong, but I was told the 0 to 60 was around 8.5 rather than 7.6 seconds. I think this relates to the speed in normal driving mode. But when you're in sports mode, it most definitely is 7.6 seconds to get from 0 to 60 mile an hour. Of course, if you're in eco mode, that's going to be doing its best to save the battery power. The acceleration is going to be a little more frugal than that, of course. And as Mark says, either way, it's pretty decent for a mid-sized family estate car. It certainly felt good to me, but then I'm coming from a petrol Peugeot 207, which doesn't exactly have... Uh, the most sprightly of performances, shall we say. Now on the subject of price, EW Dax said that he believed that the £4,000 included the government grant, so that it only equated to a £1,000 trade-in for the trade-up plug-in offer. Well, actually, that's not the case. The £3,000 government grant is separate to the trade-up plug-in offer, which gives you up to £4,000 trade-in if you're looking at the Excite model, or up to £5,000 if you're looking at the exclusive model. So that means there is a total saving of up to £8,000 if you include the £3,000 government grant and the £5,000 trade-in if you're going for the exclusive model, which is a great discount. It brings the price of the MG5 EV down to a much more affordable level just touching over the £20,000 level for a brand new electric vehicle with that sort of range, I think is exceptional. Cactus Life asked what the legroom was like in the back of the car. Now, I'm not the tallest person. I'm five foot six, which is 1.68 meters. So I don't need a huge expanse above my head. And legroom wise, it's not such a problem for me, but the MG5 EV did appear to have great legroom. I had plenty of room to stretch out there and I'm fairly confident that people that are over six foot will have enough room to stretch their legs out and head height above. And of course, one thing to bear in mind is that you don't have the transmission tunnel down the middle. It's a nice flat floor. So there's ample room for whoever is sitting there to stretch out and in the middle there is extra leg room because you don't have that transmission tunnel. Now, on the question of size, Mark Chinnery said, the size reminded me of a Ford Focus from the outside. R. Kajavis observed that it actually looked to be a bigger car than a Ford Focus, and they thought that it was about 15 centimeters taller. Well, I've looked at the statistics, and actually, there's not much difference. The exclusive model is 1536 millimeters, so 1.536 meters tall. That's the exclusive model. Now, if we look at the Ford Focus Estate, that's the active edition, that is 1532 millimeters, so 1.532 meters tall. So it's only fractionally bigger. And if we look at the Excite model, it's actually smaller. It's 1513 millimeters, so 1.513 meters. So that comes in smaller than the Ford Focus Estate Active Edition. Now, obviously there are other Ford Focuses and different, um, different heights, but I thought it was appropriate to compare it to the Estate Edition, obviously. I had a question from Jason Burgess about the ride height. He says, just wondering if it will feel too low to the ground, like my dad's Volvo estate did after driving eight years in a small SUV. He says he's tempted by the ZS EV as he's currently driving a diesel Qashqai, but he wants more range. And also he doesn't have off street parking for charging. 
As I've mentioned, I too was interested in the MG ZS EV, but it was the range that put me off a little bit because I don't have off-street parking, so I would have to rely on the charging network, just like Jason. Now, when it comes to ride height, it felt pretty standard to me, just like any other estate car that I've driven. I would say that if you are used to driving an SUV, clearly it's going to feel a different proposition when you're driving and you will feel lower to the ground. In my experience, I've quickly got used to that and it hasn't been a problem. And I have driven a few SUVs in my time. I have driven a Toyota RAV4 and also a Suzuki 4x4. So I have had that higher ride position before. And I appreciate that, yes, it does feel comfortable. You feel a little bit more secure being um, higher when you're next to the lorries. And it was the same with the MG ZS EV. I had that secure um, feeling from the ride height. But with the MG5 EV, we did go past some uh, reasonable size vehicles and I felt comfortable. Now, admittedly, we didn't go on motorway. So I wasn't going next to many um, large lorries to see how it fared. But to my mind, it was a big, secure car, but it didn't have that large ride height. And if you're used to driving a Qashqai with that additional, additional height and different viewpoint, then yeah, it's going to feel strange to you. A test drive would probably be the best bet. Um, and maybe even see if you can get a long-term test drive. I have seen that Vauxhall are offering a 48-hour test drive on the Corsa E at the moment. So it might be worth asking the question of MG and seeing if you can get the MG5 for a weekend to test drive. And then you'd get the chance to drive it on perhaps some motorways and, and gauge it against the larger lorries to see how you felt about it. But thanks for your question, Jason. Really appreciate it. And I'm glad you enjoyed the video. Thanks for that. And I hope you subscribed as well. Mark also says, I'm still trying to find out if the onboard socket takes 80 kilowatts. Well, unfortunately, no, it's only 50 kilowatts. The MG brochure states it's 50 kilowatts, but then it did for the MG ZS EV as well. And we know that that can go slightly beyond. I think it can go to in excess of 70 kilowatts. Because I haven't had a chance to charge the MG5 EV, I haven't been able to see if it goes above that 50 kilowatt level. But I'm fairly sure that I saw in another video that it doesn't and that 50 kilowatt is the maximum you can achieve. Which is a shame. It would be great to take advantage of even faster charging. Another observation from Mark Chinnery was that he thought it was a little noisy in terms of the motor whine and the tyre noise. And he also thought that there was a VES in place. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, V E double -S, S. Now this is the artificial noise that's generated at low speed to notify pedestrians that there's an electric car coming. Otherwise it would be too quiet and they wouldn't notice. With regards to the road noise, I found the MG5 EV quite quiet actually. I noticed the noise more when I test drove the MG ZS EV, and then it did seem a little noisy to me. Now, I'm not an expert at test drives, so it's not something that I picked up on. I didn't have a noise meter with me to sort of gauge the difference, but from a, from a novice point of view, it seemed quiet to me and comfortable. I didn't notice it at all. And with regards to the VES, V E -S -S, I didn't notice it on my test drive. So I'm wondering whether it's possible that it can actually be turned off on the MG5 and it had been turned off by the garage because it's certainly not something that I noticed and I think I would have picked up on that. Perhaps if there's somebody in the trade that knows a little more about the MG5 EV, they could perhaps leave a comment and let us know whether it does actually have that, that VEWS and that can be turned off. I think it's a European directive that it's got to be in place. So I'd imagine there must be the capability to turn it off when you want to. Now, apparently Jeremy Lister has an obsession and that's to do with the size of the glove box because every review that he's seen hasn't mentioned the size of the glove box. And unfortunately, mine was the same. And I'm sorry, Jeremy, 
I don't have any video footage as to the size of the glove box. Now I'm fairly sure I looked in there and to me it seemed reasonably expensive. But when I asked Mrs G3, she thought it was about the size of a CD. So that's quite a bit of a difference. Now, I wouldn't want to argue with Mrs G3, but if she's not looking at the video, I thought it was a fairly good size glove box and I was fairly happy that I would be able to fit things in like the logbook, uh, potentially CDs, uh, at the moment my face mask and hand gel and all of those sort of things. So I thought it was a reasonable size, but I'm really sorry, Jeremy, I don't have video evidence of that. So the best thing to do, go for a test drive and test it out yourself as well and see if it's got enough room to store all of your gloves in. To finish off the video, I've got a few observations from people as well. So, Jason Gittos said, thought it's classed as an SUV rather than a state. A pretty good EV for the price and not bad looking. Well, Jason, the MG ZS EV is classed as an SUV, but this is most definitely classed as an estate car. It's lower to the ground than the MG ZS EV. It's also a longer proposition. And yes, it is an estate car. And as you say, it's a great price and not too bad looking. But on the subject of looks, Andy Mid didn't really like it. And he said, it's okay and great value, but it just looks bad. Ride height seems high and the wheels are a bit small. Front end looks like a 10 year old car. Needs some work, I think. Well, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, Andy. Um, I thought it looked okay. I wouldn't say it's gonna win any beauty awards, but it, if you're not too fussed about the looks and you're more about the practicality and the affordability of the car, then this fits the bill. But yeah, if you're looking for something a little bit more special, then there are some cars on the market that are trying to turn heads. The BMW i3, for example, and of course the Peugeot E208. Although again, that is in the eye of the beholder because I really didn't like the way that it had its buttons laid out inside and that put me off the car. But certainly, thanks for the comment, Andy. And finally, here's one from John Reeves. And John says, I took one out for a test drive. I was very impressed with it. I would say the MG brand is making excellent progress. Yes, I agree with you, John. I think it's a fantastic car. The MG are making strides and pushing others to look at ways that they can bring in affordability within their cars. So whilst it's great having all the bells and whistles that a lot of the EVs have, they have to bear in mind that to bring EVs to the mass market, they may need to make sure that cars are affordable, have options that will allow people to step onto the EV platform. Now, obviously, Volkswagen are trying to do that with their ID3 range. And at the moment, at the 30K price point, that's still a little bit out of reach. But over time, they're looking to bring in other models that are gonna be bringing the price down. It will be easy to pick flaws, particularly the scratchy plastic interior door trim, until you remember the price point of the car. I think MG might be ones to watch over the coming years. With current allowances, it's nearly 17,000 less than the Model 3 and the E Nero. That's a pretty big sum of money, even if comparing apples to bananas. And yes, Mark, I have to say the price point is excellent. You're getting quite a lot for your money. And although it would have been nice to have things like adaptive cruise control on the car, you're looking at a very low entry level price once you've taken the incentives into account. And that's really what you've got to be considering there. You could get your foot on the EV path by buying the MG5 EV at a very affordable price and not worrying about the things you're missing out on. And that should see it take off to a greater market. So that's it, folks. Thanks for watching this rundown of the questions I've had on the MG5 EV. If you liked it, don't forget to click like, share the video, and please subscribe to my channel. Now, I'm gonna be going on with my journey through a whole number of ways that I'm looking to make my life a little greener, from alternative deodorants, shampoos, cleaning products, anything that I'm doing to make my life a little bit greener. So if you think that would be of interest to you, then please subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you get notified when I load up new videos. Until next time, bye.